Now you're helping in many ways fight the very guy that you used yeah. to be. So big picture advice. What, given that you were that guy, how do we fight cybercrime today and in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years? What advice do you have to individuals, to companies, to governments of what, and also to uh, Elizabeth? <laughs> like the equi- humans, human beings yeah. that love, that live, that are friends with cyber criminals. There's so many lessons to really be had from that. You know, to, to me, the the lesson, the one of the big lessons to me is is uh, you can't serve two masters. You know, if you're uh, if you're that guy that is committing crime or that person that's addicted or you're uh, you're in love with somebody that's addicted or has that, they don't love you. They love that addiction. That comes first. It's always going to come first. So you, ha- you have to realize that. You have to know when to, uh, you got to know when to cut somebody off, when to end something, that, that knowing that they're not going to change until they t- decide to change. At the same time, you got to realize that the only reason I was able to turn my life around is because people took that chance on me. Yeah. You know, that's really the only reason. They believe that there's a good person in there. Yeah. If, if, if Malarski hadn't responded, if I hadn't had my sister, my wife, these companies that, that initially gave me that chance, my ass would be back in prison for 20 years. I have no doubt about that at all. All right. So you, you have to realize that, um, you know, cyber crime. A lot of companies that I talk to, they don't really understand the or appreciate the uh, that networking aspect, that that trust aspect of how criminals establish trust with each other, mm-hmm. how they work together. A lot of companies think that it's a single player that's out victimizing them. And when you really break down how cybercrime operates, that you've got a, a group of individuals that are working together to hit you, but not only hit you, but they share and exchange information freely. You know, companies don't do that. You've got privacy concerns. You've got competitive edge concerns, everything else. Companies don't share information across the board like like criminals do. Criminals do that. Um, you have to appreciate that. You have to understand that that big statistic that 90% of your attacks use known exploits. It's not the stuff we don't know about. It's the shit we do know about. We're not doing anything about. So the way to defend against cybercrime is, is like... There's a lot of low-hanging fruit that you should fix. That, a lot of that. A lot of that. So a lot of basic stuff that's already vulnerabilities, update the system, yeah. security. Now, that doesn't take care of solar winds, right. or CNAP or anything like that. It doesn't. But those instances, I mean, that, okay, that's a big instance. But, <laughs> I mean, it is. But, but in the full spectrum of, right. uh, especially in the future, uh because there's more and more companies that are coming online, right? They're becoming digital, and it's just more and more and more. And those vulnerabilities in terms of human nature, so the, for social engineering and the actual outdated systems, all of it. Uh, some of it, I guess, is the. Uh, I mean, you're exceptionally good at this. Is educating on the social engineering side, right? Is educating people and companies that like, you've got to do that. You've got and and companies have to. You know, I made that point that. They never report to law enforcement. That's companies and in- individuals. Yeah. You know, I've worked with Fortune 50 companies that will not press charges. Instead, they'll have that insider or that criminal sign an NDA. They'll pay them off, and we won't mention this shit anymore. You have to be. Yeah. You have to press charges. You have to report. You have to raise the awareness of of everyone in the group. You have to be. It's that. It's that idea, and I've talked about that before. Of understanding your place. In that cybercrime spectrum, the way a criminal will victimize you depends on who you are and what you do as a person and as a business. So you have to understand that design security around that. You know, we've got 7,500 security companies out there. A whole lot of them are snake oil salesmen. A lot of them is going to tell you that we're the one stop solution, but yeah. you're not. You're not. You're a tool. All right. And you may have a very good tool, but it's not the only tool that's needed to protect against the attacks that are out there. And we have, we have to be open and honest about that kind of stuff if we're so, not. So I guess defending defense is not just like one tool. It's it's a process of just uh, like a diversity and just constantly educating uh, people. Absolutely. And, and so, so it's the social side. It's constantly, 
Because there's so many probably attack vectors in terms oh, of the software that you have. Yeah, if you look at it, that's, that attack surface, you can't plug everything. It's too damn large to yeah. plug everything. Yeah. But you can do the best job you can possibly do. But it, it takes a variety of tools to do that. All right. The, the idea, and Arcos is, is big about that, but the, the idea is to take the cost of fraud to the fraudsters so high that they basically try to pick another target. All right, and that's that's the idea that you want. You want it to be not worth the criminal's time to hit your company. What about uh, white hat hacking? So, like, um, you know, hacking for good, sort of testing systems, and then uh, giving companies the vulnerabilities uh, as you find them. I think it's outstanding. I do. I think that I think pen testing white hat stuff is outstanding. I truly do. I think that um, that you have to. It has to be tempered with what is reality as well, though. All right. You know, we've got a whole industry of, of people who try to sell RFID wallets that I don't know of many RFID hackers out there on the criminal side, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah. So some of it is just like a psychological safety blanket that's not actually uh, <laughs> providing any protection. By the way, you uh, wrote on LinkedIn uh, something about ID me. <laughs> what is it? Why is it a problem? I was going down a rabbit hole. With I your, was with wondering you. if you were going to mention that. You know, they they lost. Uh, I guess I was partially responsible for them losing an eighty six million dollar contract. What, what was the contract with the government? Well, the IRS. US government, yeah, just the, uh, the IRS. So, so what is it? So ID Me is an identity. Okay, backtrack. ID Me is a marketing company yeah. that wants to say they're an identity verification company. I just want to bring this up to see you get angry. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, I tell you what my issue is. Yeah, my issue is. So, so yeah, yeah, it's it's a company that's used for authentication by the IRS. I guess well, IRS, Social Security Administration, VA. Yeah. Uh, at one point, twenty three state unemployment offices, a few other services. As well. So, I guess the idea is that you would be able to unlock your account or get get you know uh, authenticate yourself as a human being. By uh, using fa your face or something like yeah, that, so or private they, information. They've got a they've got a tiered system yeah. with verification. They've got uh, you can do. Uh, they've got a free system, which is questionable, where you submit an ID, and it's been shown several bypasses have been shown. I, and I don't want to talk about their security horribly bad because I want to be honest. There are bypasses for a lot of security systems right. out there. Right. All right. Um, the the issue that I have with ID Me is that. Their policies are somewhat questionable. Um, I don't care if you're a private company that has those policies in place, but if you're a government agency and you as a citizen are entitled to a benefit or a service of that government agency, and then the government agency forces you to give up your complete identity profile to a private company, and then that private company uses that profile for marketing purposes to further profit, things like that. I have a huge issue with that. Um, I don't care if you're a private company that does that. I just don't think that citizens need to be forced into doing that in order to get a benefit or service that they're entitled to. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. that's my big issue. So that, I mean, given how much value, how much we talked about the value of identity, you don't think that should be handed over lightly? No, absolutely not. And who would have thought that Brett Johnson would ever become a privacy advocate? <laughs> <laughs> but... Here I am. <laughs> I mean, it's just it, it, people don't understand or appreciate the value of who they are. Mm -hmm. You know, and and certainly you've got a, a host of companies. ID Me is not the only one, but you've got some of these companies that say, well, we strip out the PII of the individual. We're just using the biometrics and, and the sites they're visiting and things like that. That's identity. That is, you can still ping that one unique individual out of all using that information, stripping out the PII. You can still ping who that individual is. Mm 